Welcome to the 58th New York Film Festival presented by Film at Lincoln Center. I'm Devika Girish. I'm one of the programmers of the talk section, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this very special, highly anticipated free talk. We have some amazing guests with us today that you can see on our screen already, uh, and we'll get to them very soon, but I just want to make a few remarks and say a few thanks to start us off. The New York Film Festival has always been about bringing community together to celebrate cinema. And whether you're joining us in our virtual cinema or at one of our drive-in venues this year, on behalf of everyone at Film at Lincoln Center, thank you for being a part of this historic edition. Thank you to the FLC board, patrons, members, and dedicated moviegoers who make our work possible throughout the year. As a nonprofit, we rely on your support and becoming a member is a great way to join our community of film lovers, take advantage of discounts and special offers while helping us continue sharing the best in cinema. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one today. We're also very grateful to our tireless staff and volunteers working behind the scenes to make the festival happen. And um, I just want to add that in addition to all our screenings, you can access NYFF from anywhere this year with our free virtual talk series taking place throughout the festival. Um, do subscribe to the Film at Lincoln Center podcast for engaging Q&As with filmmakers, panel discussions, much more. And you can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure that you don't miss any exciting updates or festival announcements. And join the conversation on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook with the hashtag NYFF. Last but not least, a special thank you to our many festival partners, including HBO, who is the presenting partner of uh, all Film at Lincoln Center talks, and Turner Classic Movies, the sponsor of Smooth Talk, which is the incredible film we're celebrating today. Uh, many of you might have already seen it in our virtual cinema since Saturday. It's playing until tomorrow at 8 p.m. ET, and I have a special announcement. It will return to Film at Lincoln Center starting November 6th for its virtual run. So you have plenty of chances to catch it if you haven't already. And now I'd like to introduce our special guest moderator for today. We're very lucky to have her join us. Um, she, you know, you might already know Alicia Malone as an author and a regular host on Turner Classic Movies, and she's a co-host of TCM's Women Make Film. She's an authority on classic and independent movies, and she's passionate about supporting women in cinema. She's written two books, Backwards and In Heels, about the past, present, and future for women in Hollywood, and The Female Gaze, Essential Movies Made by Women. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alicia, and I'll now hand over the virtual mic to you. Thank you so much, Devika. I am absolutely thrilled to get the opportunity to moderate this special conversation about Smooth Talk. It's been 35 years since this film was released, and part of what we are celebrating here at the New York Film Festival is a new restoration. As Devika said, the film has been playing as part of the festival. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that most of the people watching have seen the film. If you haven't, then just be aware that I am going to dig into specific moments of the movie. And just to give you an overview, Smooth Talk stars Laura Dern as Connie. She's a teenager who is discovering the, the perils and the power of her own sexuality. It was directed by Joyce Chopra and based on a story written by Joyce Carol Oates. And we are so lucky to have with us the three powerhouse women behind Smooth Talk. So let me introduce them to you. We have director Joyce Chopra, hi. Hi. Writer Joyce Carol Oates, hello. <laughs> and joining us from the countryside with hopefully Wi-Fi that will work is actor Laura Dern. Hi. Hello. <laughs> so I also want to point out if you are watching this live, you can ask questions. So submit your questions while we're doing this interview. And I'm going to make sure I leave time at the end for us to get to as many of your questions as we can. But I wanted to start off this conversation by talking about the short story that inspired Smooth Talk. It's called uh, where, are you, where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Written by Joyce Carol Oates, published in 1966. And so Joyce Carol Oates, I wanted to start with you. Under the title of your story, it says, For Bob Dylan. 
So I was wondering if you could tell, talk to us about the inspiration for your story and also how Bob Dylan fits in. Well, it's a very complex uh, situation because when I first started writing the story, it was called Death and the Maiden. And it has a very uh, sort of Hawthornian um, allegorical tone to it as if it were written from a, from a great distance, in which case I need to get really up close to the characters to make them seem to be real. And, and in other words, I was working with a sort of Nathaniel Hawthorne allegorical idea. And so of course, seeing the movie then was such a delight for me because it's fully realized as a cinematic phenomenon rather than, you know, rather than a parable. And when I was working on it, it went through stages where at first I was focusing on the serial killer, he's based on a real person who um, of course has passed into oblivion a long time ago, but he was, out, he was a serial killer who lived in the area of Tucson, Arizona. He was seducing and then murdering some teenagers. Mm -hmm. I don't remember how many. So it was based on something that had really happened and I was focusing first on him, the character I call Arnold Friend, who undergoes a number of metamorphoses. And then when I got into the story, I got much more interested in Connie and focused on her. And so the story became a different story. So and this, oh, sorry. Uh -huh. This was pre-Charles Manson. And it's interesting to look at the time period in which this story was published, uh, a period of great change and tumult in this country. So did some of that also infuse its way into this story? Well, the, the strange thing about the Ch Charles Schmidt case, I believe that was the name of this, this man, the psychopath, was that the young teenagers in this area were loyal to him rather than uh, to their own friends. I mean, they knew that he was injuring and maybe murdering some people. You know, they, they knew about him in some way, and yet they didn't tell their parents. So when I started working on the story and sort of thinking about it and brooding about it, it became a generational, uh, a look at the generations and the uh, failure to communicate or the difficulties of communicating but the teenagers had their own culture and their own world, and the adults were just astonished that there was such a distance between them. It was dedicated to Bob Dylan maybe a little later in the composition. I had been listening to one of Bob Dylan's early songs called It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, mm -hmm. and I was listening to that around the time I wrote this story. But there's no, no inevitable or natural connection between the story and Bob Dylan. And you talk about uh, teenagers and, and that dynamic, which also held true, you know, 20 years later when Smooth Talk was released. So Joyce Chopra, do you remember when you first encountered this story? Yes, um, in an O. Henry collection, what was it, I think 78. Uh, my husband uh, was a, a playwright and he was in the collection, and I, I read it. I could never get it out of my head. It scared the wits out of me. <laughs> uh, but it just stayed and stayed and stayed. Uh, and then some years later, I was able to, with him, write a script from that. Yeah, but it's, so that's how I first encountered it. I apologize if you can hear a saw in the background. Always no. the way, as soon as you start recording your neighbor decides to do some handiwork. But anyway, um, so Joyce Chopra, you know, when you read this story, as Joyce Carol Oates said, it is allegorical and it has this very elusive quality to it. It is striking and memorable, like you say. Um, but was that part of the challenge of adapting the story that not only did you have to flesh it out to make it a feature <laughs> film, but also give it that dreamlike quality? No, no, it's, it's, I think Joyce used the word in something, it's, it, the story was very spare. Uh, and in fact, short stories are much better to adapt than novels. I mean, because, uh, but no, we had, a, we had the bones of what we did are taken from that story. There was a mother-daughter conflict. 
uh, but we had to fill out Connie. We created friends for her. We also thought a lot about what kind of world would she live in that would make her vulnerable to Arnold Friend. And so we thought of her, she's not finished and the house the mother is always painting is not finished. The mother in, in the story, I believe, doesn't particularly do anything. And so uh, just, and just lines that she wrote, uh, her mother saying, you have nothing but trashy daydreams and that became part of the dialogue. Uh, oh, I wish I could remember more, but it was extremely helpful building on just a phrase to create a world. But really the story may be, I don't know, 10 or 15 pages long and the bulk of it is the encounter with Arnold Friend. So in a sense, the film is, some people point out it's almost two films. It's the first part that we created. Um, and then there's this encounter with Arnold that takes a half hour in the movie. Um, yeah. yeah. One of my favorite lines from the story is everything about her had two sides to it. One for home <laughs> and one for anywhere that was not home. And Laura, I feel like that was a quality that you really brought out in Connie. Um, this was, you, you were, I think, 17 at the time, and it was pretty early on in your film career, but you had worked with great directors like Peter Bogdanovich for Mask. So I'm curious to know if, if you remember, were you searching for particular roles or wanting to work with particular people, or was it more about what came your way? Well, I have to give entire credit, frankly, to uh, the two women I'm honored to share this Zoom with, um, both the, the haunted capturing of the delicacy of adolescence that Joyce Carol Oates gave us in the story, and then Joyce and Tom's adaptation um, allowed it to evolve in that home life as well as anywhere from home. And what Joyce did, and when the film came out, in fact, as you're right, I was older, but she was determined to cast a girl who was that breach between childhood and adulthood so that the actress wouldn't necessarily know um, the wisdom that these two women had and the terror they might have about how delicate a time this was. So I was in fact 15 when Joyce cast me and I didn't know a lot of what I was uh, acting, frankly. I was, I was still in the throes of a deep um, and entrenched mother-daughter relationship and trying to find my way and my own identity and wanting to be seen and wanting to be seen um, you know, by boys as well as men and not knowing how terrifying that could potentially be. I was missing the point, which is why I think I was able to be unaware of the world I was in as a character and as an actor. So I, I commend Joyce for being unrelenting and thank God ultimately discovering uh, me and really my first true lead in a film and, um, and feeling that I captured the thing that hopefully they both were trying to get at about this delicate and, and somewhat terrifying moment and also bullish and like arrogant and uh, and a little girl it's like all of that and I, I i wish i could say i could have acted it at 18 but i love that i was naive enough to not know what i was doing um so. yeah i mean also I tell a story actually of how i got to catch laura uh, I sure should remember this well. We couldn't find the actress for this part. We had cast Treat Williams, and he was able, we weren't offering any money, it was uh, minimums, and he only had one week in late September. So we set that as a start date. Two weeks before, we still didn't find the girl we wanted, because on the page, she comes across as unpleasant. and. I said, no, no, that's not what I have in mind. And uh, our producer, Martin Rosen, uh, God bless him, was on the phone 
with a still photographer in LA and is come, sort of trying to get her to come up for free, Nancy Ellison, to do stills. And he said, oh, we're really stuck here. We don't have our main actress. And we're supposed to start filming in two weeks. She's, and this woman said, she lives in Malibu Beach Colony. She said, I see her. She didn't say, I see an actor. She said, I see her. She's walking by my window on the beach. It's Bruce Dern's daughter. And she was so convinced without having read the script that she'd cast the movie for us. So I flew to LA the next day. No, I called Laura Dern's phone and she wasn't there, but she had it's the days of answering machines. And she was playing the song that's important in the movie Handyman, the James Taylor song was on her answering machine, which was astonishing. And then I flew to LA and there she comes bouncing along, hair flying, I get in her car. I'm about to go and record her, you know, Edition, audition, and on her stick shift is a postcard of James Dean, the very one we had identified for the script. So it was mind boggling. And of course, her reading was out of this world. So a fateful phone call. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was meant to be. And, and I was reading, Laura, that you had written on that James Dean picture. I love you, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I had forgotten. <laughs> and he did. He really did. <laughs> I have no doubt. And, you know, Joyce Carol Oates, when I was watching this film again after having read your story. I mean, I have to say, Laura, whether she knew it or not, just seemed to perfectly encapsulate the Connie that you wrote. You know, what did you think about this casting choice? Oh, absolutely. When I think of this, when I think of the story or if I read the story, I just think of Laura. She's sort of, she's completely usurped it and she's completely transformed it. Oh, in the my end, God. Amazing. I saw it. I thought to myself, no, they can't possibly do the ending, you know, my story. And indeed, they don't. You know, it's a it goes in a completely different tonal direction and literal direction, and it becomes really uplifting and transcendent, whereas my ending was tragic. Mm. Well, you know, Joyce, originally we were going to end with her just going out the door, and Tom and I couldn't bear killing her off. We love cut Laura so much that actually the last part we wrote while we were filming. Well, I don't think that anybody could do the ending because the ending is has a kind of poetic pose. No. Yes. You just would have an action and that wouldn't communicate it. So yeah. you needed a different ending and you came up with a perfect ending. Thank you. And Joyce Carol Oates, uh, am I right in saying this was the first major adaptation of one of your work? Oh, absolutely. I, absolutely. Yes. Did you have reservations about it? No. Well, we were all so much younger then. I don't. <laughs> I don't had any expectations. Probably speaking for everyone, we didn't have any expectations about anything. I was just, you know, enraptured, mm -hmm. and I was sitting in the screening in New York City, and it just sort of staring at the screen and with a, a roaring in my ears, like I'm going to faint or something, mm -hmm. and it was all like a dream. And then it, it ended. And then I was just sitting there with, next to my husband, Ray Smith, at the time. And Lucinda Franks, who subsequently has gone on to win the Pulitzer Prize, she turned around and she said to me, oh, Joyce, that was wonderful. <laughs> I thought, it was wonderful. It kind of, I didn't really have any, any words until that moment. I mean, you know, you, you write in such a wonderfully descriptive way that it's, it's so vivid when you read the story. And then to watch the film, particularly the scene with Arnold Friend, who drives up in his car, and it's kind of the, the role that you would normally see a James Dean type play, this very cool uh, guy who has it all together, but then there's something really off-putting about him. And, you know, Laura, did I read correctly that that was the first scene that you filmed? Is that right, Joyce? Yes. Was yeah. that where we started? Yeah. Laura, yes. Do you remember? You know, I, 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 well, what's that, Joyce? Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, as, as we're talking, you know, um, of the many brilliant choices that Joyce made as our filmmaker, another that was extraordinary was her asking Jim Glennon, our cinematographer, to shoot the film with us. And he was, 
he was an amazing partner and he was a brilliant cinematographer, this being a, a very beloved camera operator. This was his first feature. He had just done El Norte as his first film as a cinematographer and this being his second. And he was a brilliant craftsman. But Joyce, given her instincts and her understanding of women and girls, particularly for this film. She also brilliantly cast a cinematographer who was raising adolescent daughters. Yes. And Jim had such a protectiveness about Connie in the shots they chose together. Don't you think, Joyce, that Absolutely. I, I one of, I, I'll never, forget of all the things we shot, one of the images that has stayed with me my whole life as a viewer is Connie in this corridor of the hall in shadow, trying to call the phone, realizing she's in danger now. And you can see Arnold Friend at the end of the hall sort of being seductive and grooming her through this screen door while she knows she's trapped, right? And, and it's, it, it's just so beautifully shot. So I just, as we're talking about this extraordinary opportunity for me to be a collaborator with such muses and maestros, um, maestras, I should say, uh, you know, Jim was also just a, a wonderful guide from the beginning and yeah. And, uh, and Tom Cole, who's such an extraordinary writer and writing partner on this with Joyce, you know, also as the father of a daughter, I felt like it was such a, an open space, especially starting with that sequence, for me as a girl to talk safely and freely in an environment about vulnerability and longing and sexuality. I was very blessed with all the stories that are, are, are not positive. I had an incredibly protective experience um, and learned a great deal about the fragility of female sexuality um, through, through these amazing writers and filmmakers. Yeah, I'm sure that made you feel really safe. And um, I mean, it, it is such a, a tightrope that we all walk as, as women and, and as young girls and teenagers when we first discover that being in this body can be dangerous. It can turn dangerous at any moment. And it often feels like our fault. You know, the, the film to me has so much realism in it. And Joyce Chopra, this was your first narrative feature film, but you came from the world of documentaries. So do you think working in documentaries informed this work? I'm not sure. I did a film, a documentary a few years before that um, called Girls at 12. And I followed three girls who were 12, just about to start high school. And I was curious to know whether they would change once they were in high school. And indeed, I saw it happening. I mean, the smartest of them suddenly couldn't pass her math class. I mean, why? I mean, she, she was boy crazy. Uh, anyway, and then having my own daughter, who at that time was, I don't know, she was about 12 or 13, and I was having my own troubles with her. I mean, she used to come in every morning and I'd be able to kiss the top of her head. And one morning she said, I'm not your property, you know. Just that inspired a scene in the movie. <laughs> yeah. But I want to talk about Laura. Laura's been so full of praise for me and Tom, but I will return it. Laura, do you remember, Treat had to leave before we finished filming. And what was missing were Laura at the screen door talking to Treat. And this was very difficult to do. And I read Treat's part. And Laura could have read with Post. So all those close-ups of Laura in that scene, <laughs> Laura was playing with her, she, she was looking at me, but she was seeing Treat. Well, I don't know who she was seeing, but Laura, you were amazing. I don't know how you did that. Wow, that's, oh, God. you know, that's sweet, but he was, he was, you know, 
oh. extraordinary and left obviously such an impression. And, you know, I have to say to Joyce Carol Oates, Joyce Chopra and I were speaking last night and we hadn't talked about the film in so long, um, in the years of our friendship since. And it was so amazing. I think it was the first time I had said this to you, Joyce, but because I made it at 15, not, not understanding so much of the, of the story and of what would, how the film would be perceived, I did share with Joyce that, you know, then at 17, to have people come up to me and men come up to me and share their experience of the movie mm-hmm. and my performance was uh, quite an entry into adulthood. And it was seen very differently by different people. You know, I, I remember still haunted by the thing I thought we'd made and feel people say, oh my God, I'm never gonna let my daughter out of the house. This is the most terrifying film. As Steven Spielberg, you know, Joyce was such a great admirer of, of the film, the story of, of Joyce's filmmaking. And he was like, we were traumatized. It left such an impression on him. And, and then I would have great artists, certain people come up to me and be like, that is the sexiest movie. You know, you're the most sensual character I've seen in a film. <laughs> and so I was suddenly Connie. I was suddenly Connie in, in perceptions and the experience of people's perceptions of me that I, that I I was now having to catch up with. So it was really, it was an amazing thing to, to bear witness to. Yeah. And Joyce Carol Oates was, was that an experience that you went through in publishing the story? Obviously you were older than Laura, but did people come and share their own experiences and how they felt, especially about your ending? Well, I, I would not have known it at the time, but it, it went on to become one of the most anthologized stories. So we're talking now about decades and generations of students who often read it in high school in English class. And so I have, I'm deluged with letters, and it just seems that it's contemporary, even though it was written so long ago. There's something timeless about the, the young girl. And the confrontation with adult male sexuality, which she has, she sort of misinterprets as just a kind of teenage situation. And it's actually not. It's actually an adult male. Yeah. And and in watching the film, you know, I was struck by how often, Laura, you, you looked much older than you were one second and then like a child the next. And with Treat Williams, how he could look young one one minute and then older the next. Uh, so Joyce Chopra to you, uh, can you tell us about casting Treat? Because he seems like the very embodiment of Arnold Friend who did that role so perfectly. I had him in mind from the beginning when we wrote the screenplay that I wanted Treat to play the part. And I, I can't remember who introduced us honestly, but he was living on the West Side in the 70s and uh, we made an appointment for me to come by and I knocked on the door and he opened it. He was wearing a baseball cap with the front sort of pulled down and he looked like a teenager. And then as soon as he stepped back, he was a man in his thirties. <laughs> it was perfection. And he very much wanted to do the part. So, and he was our star. I mean, Laura was just beginning. So we, we, did all the production planning around the treat schedule. Yeah, yeah, Joyce Carol Oates, what did you think about Treat's performance as Arnold Friend? Well, I thought it was brilliant. And it's one of these strange mysteries how young teenagers can so misjudge others. Looking back to the original, the serial killer, Charles Schmidt, it was obvious to any adult that he wasn't a teenager, he was in his 30s, and he was wearing, he was wearing makeup, and he, he really was playing the part of a teenager, and yet the actual teenagers didn't see that. It's almost like there's a different visual perception. 
Yeah, and I, I don't know if I am, you know, reading your story correctly or not, but to me it also seemed like there's so much about performance in your story, like Connie is performing womanhood before she knows how that works and Arnold Friend is very much performing how Connie says, you know, nobody talks like that. You're crazy. Yeah. That's an interesting way of looking at it. The idea of the performative self. I wasn't thinking of that at the time, but that's very relevant. Yes. Uh, you know, treat subtly changed uh, some of the dialogue. It's, it's almost all yours in the encounter, Joyce, but I was rereading the story last night uh, and Arnold Friend in the story very directly says, if you don't come out, I'm going to kill your parents. And Treat changed it to, what if you didn't come out? What if uh, I said that? And it was so subtle a change, but it suited how he wanted to play it. And I was very happy with that. Yes, that's, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Laura, what was it like for you, you know, being so young and being in a scene with him? <laughs> Well, it was a one act play. I mean, it truly was the adaptation of Joyce's extraordinary work, you know, that we, we separate from the, the entire film. There was this gift of a half hour scene, which I mm. haven't had ever in another movie. So it was its own film and its own story. And what I thought um, was was so seamless about the, the sort of master work shared between these three writers focus is, you know, it's what you long for in adaptation that within this scene that we had, that we started with as this own, its own film, they gave you all the reasons that Joyce Carol Oates, you just expressed in why this teenager would miss it, would miss what was in front of her. You know, this, this jealous, um, somewhat in a dark space sister at this moment and her growth who wouldn't be seeing her. Um, a mother overworked and, and she feels like her mother's not going to see her. Um, a father that longs for connection, but also is in his own universe. Um, boys that might delight in her, but she's a little more mature than where they're at. <laughs> and the mall rat culture that doesn't really give you joy, but for the like eight minutes you're shopping for a crop top or an eyeliner. And every choice that was made to surround that interaction with Arnold Friend, once you've seen it, is so haunting to look back on because there are all the pointed reasons why one grown up, you know, seeing you the way others just are missing your essence, your intelligence, your adulthood is, is, um, you know, a terrifying opportunity mm -hmm. um, as, we, as we see tragically over and over again in the world. And so the fact that they captured this in their writing and then gave us an opportunity to bring it to film was so, to me, I feel so grateful for it now as I'm raising someone exactly the age of Connie currently. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just um, magnificent and and you can't win and it's so vulnerable, you know? Yeah, there's so many layers to that scene and you can almost see Connie thinking like, oh, I should have listened to my mother or she cries out for her mother. And that mother-daughter relationship in the film rang so true, uh, I know to me and I'm sure to many girls as well. So Joyce Chopra, can you talk about that dynamic and what you wanted to add in because that's something that wasn't necessarily in the story. It wasn't in the story. And uh, that's, in a way you might say what the film is about is a mother-daughter relationship and the, mis and the misunderstandings between them. 
the fight that Connie has with her mother that's ongoing that uh, causes her to stay home and not go with the family. If she'd gone with them, this never would, she would not have encountered Arnold. And so it was very important to build that side of the story, uh, the mother's jealousy and hurt, you know, that, that the daughter is no longer close to her. So in that scene where they're painting a house together and the mother's so happy that they're do, finally doing something together and the daughter pulls away for a moment and it's so hurtful to the mother. And I understood that personally, as I said, because I'd just gone through that my, for about two or three years. My daughter really, it was just very distant, you know, and please don't play that music in the car when we're approaching school, you know. And uh, so, yeah, we built that up. Tom did, yeah. Yeah, and that and feeling of... Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Laura. No, I was just going to say, and the casting of Levon Helm oh. was just so genius. Because, you know, <laughs> while... On the other hand, this father who <laughs> seems so, you know, sweet and tender and completely checked out from the mother-daughter dynamic because it's just not happening in his orbit at all. Yeah, yeah he, uh, he seems so ready to believe Collie, Connie's uh, obvious lies about, you know, going to the movies. He kind of just, it's like ticking a box, like, oh, I asked her about it, so it's okay, and I'll just believe what she says. You know, Joyce Carol Oates, uh, what did you think when you watched the film and, and you saw how that mother and daughter relationship had been fleshed out? Well, I've seen a number of adaptations of this short story because as I mentioned, it, it has been anthologized so much. So when young people go to film school, they, they feel that they can make a short film or a video, and, they, and often it would be this. So I've seen many adaptations, but they're all short, and they all completely, they just completely excise the mother-daughter relationship oh. and the sister. There's some, some of the little adaptations are only about 15 minutes long, and they're only about two people. So it's a very different and very uh, sort of skeletal story. It doesn't have the underpinnings. It doesn't have the subtextual emotional foundation that Joyce Chopper brought to it because of this presentation of the generational conflict. Because when you take away the mother, there's no generational conflict. Yeah, that's so true. And, and something that um, Joyce Chopper and Tom Cole added in the in the screenplay, which I thought gave me a real key into understanding Connie, uh, was the line, you know, the boys are so nice to you, when Connie talks about going off with these boys and, and what she gets out of it. And Laura it made me think about how, you know, for a lot of us, we have these romantic ideals about love, thanks to the movies, but they don't necessarily match up with reality. Mm. So much so. <laughs> um, I, you know, I also, you know, I wish I could remember um, exactly what Joyce's direction was, you know, but one of the extraordinary gifts of working with such a great filmmaker who oh. happens to be a woman, but also therefore has the insight into a woman and a girl and the way she did um, we could have conversations that I, I could have never had with anybody else around the line, what if my eyes were brown, mm. which is the line that I say when I'm, when he's now got me. And it's just the most interesting, um, it's just the most interesting thing that happens there. And I know that I, the time was young, but what and Tom both articulated and whatever I understood as, as young as that mind was from how haunted I was by Joyce Carol Oates' story, what I knew somewhere in me was what was coming and that what was coming was unparalleled devastation and that somehow Joyce articulated 
articulated that there might be a part of me to survive it that would want to feel like I was in control. Right. Like that somehow I'd made the choice. So that as I walk out of the house, it's almost coy and flirtatious. It's almost like I know your number or something. It's weird. It, it scares me when I see it now. But, but I remember in our conversations, Joyce, um, inspiring an idea that I might need somehow to try to survive a thing. And that was, um, I'm very, yeah, I'm very frightened by that. I find it so interesting, and complicated, and so grateful to the original story to, to hold the terror, but think of survivor shame and, 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 and uh, what's to come in a moment. Uh, just really interesting. So again, endlessly blessed by all that they. I have to report uh, something to Joyce. Joy. I had a, went to a screening early on and it was a group of older people somewhere outside of New York City. It was a large audience. I forget the name, it was the great critic for the Village Voice, Andrew Saris was, was moderating it. And somebody in the audience after this group talk back said, well, you know, it was all a dream. And Andrew and I said, what was all a dream? Oh, our new friend. You see, she was outside sunbathing and she fell asleep. And it turned out half the audience couldn't accept that it happened and they decided it was a dream. That is interesting. I, I often ask if it's- Have that before? Yes, people have asked me that, but, uh, but obviously it isn't. And you, and obviously it isn't, but I was so shocked. <laughs> people don't, be, people believe all sorts of strange things, you know? Yes, they do. People believe things that their eyes are telling them something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also scary to confront the reality that this is something that, that happens, you know, and, and uh, Joyce Carol Oates, you touched on this before, but now that it's been 35 years since the film and 54 years since your story was published, and it feels perhaps even more resonant and, and important and urgent than ever, this story, you know, why do you think it, it has been so timeless? Well, probably the situation itself is timeless. And the Me, the Me Too movement came along in recent years, but before that, there was a, sort of a sense, a communal sense among women and girls about the world being very fraught and, and precarious, but there wasn't any consciousness of it. So now we can point to the Me Too movement, which does make it conscious and articulate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you are exactly right. And so now we have some time for audience questions. So I'm going to have a look at these. Uh, the first one is a question for Joyce Chopra. Can you discuss the wardrobe choices? And also says, such a brilliant film. Well, we were so low on budget that most of the clothing, except for the halter, were Lorders. It's, <laughs> am I right, Laura? That's totally right. <laughs> So, uh, yes, Carol Otis, our costume designer, certainly helped dress the other teenage girls and all that. But, uh, and Arnold friends were simple. It was just blue jeans and a t-shirt or an open shirt. But, uh, yes, thanks to Laura's extensive wardrobe now. She wore the same clothing over and over again, which is how most people dress. Yeah, but I like the way that, you know, speaking of the two sides, you know, earlier that she puts the jersey over the top of the halter yeah. top and then takes it off when she's outside, you know, in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of reveals herself. Uh, here's a question for Joyce Carol Oates. How did you balance the devilishness for Treat Williams' performance? Oh, actually, this is for Joyce Chopra. How did you balance the devilishness for Treat Williams' performance as Arnold Friend? He's not able to cross the threshold without an invitation. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? So I, I guess the question is saying, you know, and it's probably, actually, I might throw this to Joyce Carol Oates because it's about how Arnold Friend wasn't able to cross the threshold. And uh, one part of the question is, the there is a, the threshold of Connie's place that he has to be invited in. And oh, so I guess the question is whether he was the devil. 
Well, the story does reach for a sort of surreal level so that he, all along, he could see into the future and he has, his, he has powers of imagination because, as I said, it, it had its metal as a sort of Nathaniel Hawthorne parable of, about death, death and the maiden. We think of medieval woodcuts in which a maiden, a beautiful young girl, is looking at her adoringly at her reflection in a mirror and death is behind her figure of death and she doesn't see it you know this is was the common theme in the in the medieval sensibility that death is coming for you and so you shouldn't be so vain you should look to god you know with sort of a, a, a religious admonition yeah and was that something, Joyce Trepper, that you played with in terms of his performance? No, it was, it was, no, it was very particular to the actor's choice. And his, his choice is that he's very vain and he prides himself on seducing girls to come out on their own volition. He, do, he doesn't really want to come in the house. It, it would be a defeat for him if he had to use force. I think also that this, the movie is, is a brilliant poetic work of naturalism. And to introduce any supernatural element into the film would really be incongruous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it, it seemed like it was a, a scene in the movie that was more about the power struggle and yeah. him having power over Connie. And then at the end, when Laura refers to uh, the very end, he says to her, his last line, my sweet little blue eyed girl. And that's how the short story ends. We added, what if, or what, I can't remember, we were all collaborating. What if my eyes were brown? But it, as she says, that's a moment where she transitioned into trying to take some sort of control away from his power. I mean, yeah. he's seeing her as a cliche, yeah. but declaring, well, I'm not that. I'm not yeah, that's that. Right. Yeah. There's a question about Mary Kay Place. So before I ask that, Laura, I just want to know from you, what was it like to play with her in this, uh, this combative relationship. I mean, she's just the greatest. Yeah. Uh, Mary Kay Place is a godsend <laughs> to us all. I got so lucky that um, I've worked with her a couple more times um, through our lives. And, um, you know, it was such a gift because she showed up for rehearsals and was ready to literally like bunk up together, spend every waking moment together, go to the mall together and really work at this relationship. And Joyce had me come up. I want to say Joyce, it was at, at least, it, it was two or three weeks early, wasn't it? We had real time in the old days on movies. <laughs> we really rehearsed and things. I think you came up practically the day after I met you. Because I did. I lived with you guys. I mean, literally with their daughter, Sarah, and she and Tom, we stayed together. And then Mary Kay came up. So we really had time to, yeah, develop the relationship. And that was amazing. And she's always been game um, as such a, an amazing actor and artist to, uh, to kind of hurl herself into it and had such great success at a very young age and, and in television and film. But Mary Kay is the first person to sign up for the smallest independent film uh, to be there for the art, you know, and, and continues to do that um, as she did with Diane last year, which her performance was so beautiful. Um, amazing and uh and so it's so admirable like oh we can go three weeks early let's do that you know she just so it, it was really great to have that kind of time together and the question joyce chopra said you know uh she gives such a great performance as the mother so sympathetic even though like connie she has some major flaws so can you share more about her contribution Mary Kay. Oh, I fell in love with her the minute I met her in New York at a coffee shop when I, you know, reached out to her to play the movie. As Laura said, she's, she's so present in her performances. Every time um, she, under, she understood the part, she understood how to work with Laura. Uh, 
for whatever reason, Levon Helm's accent would just throw her into fits of hysterical laughter. <laughs> so for many a time we had to stop filming because then Laura would catch it and we just had to stop. So she just, she kept things alive for us. And as Laura said, she's a wonderful actress. Laura, what's the name of the next film you did with her where you're the glue sniffing girl? Citizen Ruth. Citizen oh, Ruth. Film. She was, yeah. She was great in that. Oh, she's yeah. amazing in that movie. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned Diane because I thought she was just wonderful in that film. Oh. Uh, a question for Laura. The switch in your performance as Connie when Arnold Friend shows up at your house is chilling and mesmerizing to watch. Do you recall what went through your mind? Mm. Well, you know, I wouldn't have, no, except I was moved by your um, suggesting and bringing up to Joyce Carol Oates this idea of performative behavior. And I think, you know, I think that that was probably the switch is how I was behaving for this adult man who was paying interest in me. Um, and that was a completely different person than I was with my family or with the boys that, mm -hmm. you know, I felt I was above ultimately. Um, and, and we're a little bit cruel. I mean, that's the thing too. It's an age where everybody feels cruel. My mom was cruel. My sister was cruel. The boys and the mean girls are cruel. And here comes this nice older man who sees me like nobody else and knows that I deserve <laughs> seeming attention, tenderness. I mean, like Joyce Carol Oates, you said, it's just so terrifying how that age person can see things so shockingly differently. But I think that's how I perceived it in the character. Yeah. Our species. The safe, the safe place. <gasps> I was going to say that our species is so impressionable. We're very vulnerable to any kind of mesmerizing person who seems to address us and make us feel special including politicians, you know, this is some sort of black magic that is, is exacted on particularly vulnerable people. Mm. Yeah, Joyce Carol Oates, can you talk a little bit about that more? Because something that struck me in reading the story was how at times Connie thinks, you know, is that the voice from the radio? Have I met him? And she's going through so many different thoughts in her mind. It's like he's gaslighting her. Absolutely. As you said before, it was a pre-Charles Manson time. Charles Manson and his family are the best examples of this sort of seduction of vulnerable, you know, not unattractive girls, but they were very vulnerable, and he cast a kind of spell on them. Yeah, and it, it seems like he's performing as if he is like a, f a famous person that they should know. A friend, I like that as well, Arnold Friend, a friend. Um, for Joyce Chopra, Smooth Talk won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. Mm -hmm. So this person is curious to know what your experience was like at that festival. Oh God, it was a week long festival and I was so anxious the whole time. I didn't, I don't think I saw any other films. I just floated around or not even floated. I just was very unhappy <laughs> and scared. And I never expected it to win at all. How old were you then? How old was I? 48, I think, yeah, around 48, yeah. Yeah, and Laura, were you there at that Sundance Film Festival? No. No, I wasn't there, uh -huh. but... I got sent photographs and to this day, having been many times now to Sundance, it always stays in my mind. Am I right, Joyce, that it was the first year or second year? Of the festival? Yeah. Like that, yeah. And what was amazing was you had sent a photo and it was literally Robert Redford, Joyce, and you know the eight or nine other filmmakers around a dinner table celebrating their movies and that was sort of like the last night of the thing because it was still so small and it's oh, just it was, so 
massive now, but, um, but I remember it being very, um, it, it feeling very it was tender funny. and warm. And, yeah. Yeah. It was before, the, the year after Quentin Tarantino won with Six Lines and Videotape. And that's what changed everything because it got sold for quite a bit of money. David Soderbergh, yeah. And yeah, after that, right. all the paparazzi came and it became a party scene. Because I went back a few years later because I wanted to go skiing and I just wanted to enjoy the festival. And I did that. And even by two years later, it was already changed. Yeah. Yeah, now mm -hmm. you have all the gifting suites and everything else. Yeah. Uh, we've got another question for Joyce Chopra. Can you talk about your decision to work with James Taylor and use so much of his music? And this was before you heard Laura Dern's answering machine. Okay, this is another piece of luck. I lived at that time in uh, Connecticut, Northwest Connecticut, and James was a neighbor. And he came by one night for dinner on his own. And we had just finished a scene or something for the script. Tom and I were sort of very happy about what, we were in a great mood. And he said, why are you so happy? And we said, we've written this script. And he said, oh, can I read it? And I was a little taken aback because I was in awe of him. And he read it and he came back the next night and he said, I want to do the music. And there was one line in the stage directions that Tom had written that had particularly appealed to him is when Connie and her friend, is standing looking at the drive-in movie theater, at the movie theater, the drive-in hangout where all the kids come to flirt, make out. And there, uh, Tom wrote something like, it was like looking at Paris cross the river through the trees or something very poetic that people don't usually put in screenplays. And that had touched James so much. So that's how he came to do music. And it seems perfect to draw a line from Bob Dylan to James Taylor. And mm. that's where we will wrap up today's conversation. I want to thank you all so much for joining us, Joyce Chopra, Joyce Carol Oates, and Laura Dern. Thank you so much for sharing your time today. Thank you for doing Thank it. you. Thank you so much. And may I just say, Joyce Carol Oates, you're such a hero to me. Yes. And what an honor it is to have been part of this story and to get to share this time. And Joyce Chopra, what a gift of an extraordinary filmmaker you are. If we had made the movie two years ago, you would be the most sought after filmmaker in the business. And you are one of our great pioneers who forged a very difficult path as a female filmmaker. And so for female filmmakers everywhere, we are so blessed to have you as a storyteller to forge the way to make it easier for others. So thank you. And thank you for being such an amazing guide to us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank I am, I'm honored to get to talk to all of you. And I also want to say to everyone watching, if you haven't seen Smooth Talk, then Film at Lincoln Center is presenting the new Janus Films restoration in a virtual run from November the 6th. There's also plenty more coming up for the New York Film Festival. So make sure you check out the schedule. And can I say, make sure you tune in to TCM every Tuesday evening yes. as we celebrate Women Make Film in our series that delves into the craft and artistry of female filmmakers. Thank you all for having us and have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye.